Welcome to chapel. Uh, my name is Miss Roth, uh, and I'm excited to help plan with these wonderful people up here a chapel to help us celebrate a couple of months that are coming up. Uh, this month, February, is Black History Month that is celebrated here in the U.S., and next month, March, is Women's History Month. Uh, so we decided to combine those two and introduce you to a number of incredible black women Americans who have changed our country country for the better. So today we're going to introduce you to a number of those women who have impacted U.S. history and you will get a chance to hear from them in their own voice even as we'll be reading a number of things that they wrote or spoke. Uh, as just to give you some logistical information. Um, as we talk about each woman, there will be a slide up with uh, biographical information about her, and so you can read through that, um, but the individuals up here will be reading th uh, their own words. I'm gonna start with a quote from Pauli Murray. True community is based upon equality, mutuality, and reciprocity. It affirms the richness of individual diversity as well as the common human ties that bind us together. And I think that's a great way to think about both Black History Month and Women's History Month as we begin those celebrations. I'm Eli Stoll, and I'm going to read a poem by Phyllis Wheatley. Should you, my Lord, while you pursue my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good, by feeling hearts alone best understood, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from his father seized his babe, his babe beloved. Such, such my case, and can I then but pray, others may never feel tyrannic sway. I'm Mackenzie, and I'm going to read an excerpt from Jarena Lee's autobiography. I now told him that the Lord had revealed it to me, that I must preach the gospel. But as to women preaching, he said that I disciplined knew nothing at all about it, that it did not call for women preachers. This I was glad to hear, because it removed the fear of the cross. But no sooner did this feeling cross my mind than I found that a love of souls had in a measure departed from me. That holy energy which burned within me as a fire began to be smothered. This I soon perceived. Oh, how careful ought we to be lest through our bylaws of church government and discipline we bring into disrepute, disrepute even the word of life. For as unseemly as it may appear nowadays for women to preach, it should be remembered that nothing is impossible with God. And why should it be thought impossible, heretical, or improper for a woman to preach, I seeing, the woman I seeing the Savior died for the woman as well as for the man? If the man may preach because the Savior died for him, why not the woman, seeing he died for her also? Is he not a whole Savior instead of a half one? As those who hold it wrong for a woman to preach would seem to make it appear. Did not Mary first preach the risen Savior? And is not the doctrine of the resurrection the very climax of Christianity? Hangs not all I hope on this, as argued by St. Paul. Then did not Mary, a woman, preach the gospel, for she preached the resurrection of the crucified Son of God. Mammy Kate was an enslaved woman who was owned by Stephen Hurd from 1740 to 1815. In 1820, Stephen was kidnapped by the British and sentenced to death. Because of Mary Kate, she had so much compassion with the intent of rescue, so she went to the Redcoat uh, camp where he was kept, and she became a Redcoat laundress. And she did this so that she could uh, have she could have their trust and. When she was finally like trusted, she went into Stephen Hurd's uh, prison and smuggled him out with her laundry basket, which she then like carried on her head. And when they returned back to uh, Stephen's home, she, Stephen freed her for her bravery, but she chose to continue working for him for the rest of her life. Um, I'll be talking about Elizabeth Freeman, or Mumbet, and she was born enslaved to a prominent lawyer in Massachusetts, and she later sued for her freedom with the help of an abolitionist lawyer after hearing the new Massachusetts state constitution. 
Um, the courts ruled in her favor, which led to her becoming free and slavery being outlawed in Massachusetts. She changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman after she was freed, and she worked as a servant in her attorney's home and was buried in their family plot. She was the first African American to file and win a freedom suit in Massachusetts. And a quote by her is, any time, any time while I was a slave, if one minute's freedom had been offered to me and I had been told I must die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it. Just to stand one minute on God's earth as a free woman, I would. Okay. Okay, I'm going to be reading um, an excerpt from Francis Harper's speech, All Wrapped Together. Or all wrapped, all wrapped Up Together. We are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity. And society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. You tried in, that, in, the, you tried in the case of the Negro. You pressed him down for two centuries, and in doing so, you crippled the moral strength and paralyzed the spiritual energies of the white men of the country. When the hands of the black were fettered, white men were deprived of the liberty of speech and the freedom of the press. Society cannot afford to neglect the enlightenment of any class of its members. At the South, the legislation of the country was in behalf of the rich slaveholders, while the poor white man was neglected. What is the consequence today? From that very class of neglected poor white men came the man who stands today with his hand upon the helm of the nation. He fails to catch the watchword of the hour and throws himself, the incarnation of meanness, across the pathway of the nation. My objection to Andrew Johnson is not that he has been a poor white man. My objection is that he keeps poor whites all the way through. That is the trouble with him. This grand and glorious revolution which has commenced will fail to reach its climax of success until throughout the length and breadth of the American Republic, the nation shall be so colorblind as to know no man by the color of his skin or the curl of his hair. It will then have no privileged class trampling upon outraging the unprivileged classes, but will then be one great privileged nation whose privilege will be to produce the loftiest manhood and womanhood that humanity can obtain. I do not believe that giving women the ballot is immediately going to cure all ills of life. I do not believe that white women are dewdrops just exalted from the skies. I think that like men, they may be divided into three classes, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. The good would vote according to their convictions and principles, the bad as dictated by prejudice or malice, and the indifference will vote on the strongest side of the question with the winning party. You white women speak here of rights. I speak here of wrongs. I, as a colored woman, have had in this country an education which has made me feel as if I were in the situation of Ishmael, my hand against every man and every man's hand against my own. Let me go tomorrow morning and take my, take my seat in one of your streetcars. I do not know that they will do it in New, in New York, but they will in Philadelphia. And the conductor will put his hand up and stop the car rather than letting me ride. I will be reading an excerpt from Mary Church Terrell's speech, The Progress of Colored Women, given in 1898. When one considers the obstacles encountered by colored women in their effort to educate and cultivate themselves since they became free, the work they have accomplished and the progresses they have made will bear favorable comparison, at least with that of their more fortunate sisters, from whom the opportunity of acquiring knowledge and the means of self-culture have never been entirely withheld. Not only are colored women with ambition and aspiration handicapped on the account of their sex, but they are almost everywhere baffled and mocked because of their race. Not only because they are women, but because they are colored women, are discouragement and disappointment meeting them at every turn. 
but in spite of the obstacles encountered, the progress made by colored women along many lines appears like a veritable miracle of modern times. Forty years ago, the great masses of colored women, there was no such thing as home. Today, in each and every section of the country, there are hundreds of homes among colored people, and the mental and moral tone of which is as high as pure as can be found among the best people of any land. As the brains of colored women expanded, their hearts began to grow. No sooner had the heads of a favored few been filled with knowledge than their hearts yearned to dispense blessings for, for the less fortunate of their race. With tireless energy and eager zeal, colored women have worked in every conceivable way to elevate their race. Of the colored teachers engaged in instructing our youth, it is probably no exaggeration to say that fully 80% are women. In the backwoods, remote from the civilization and comforts of the city and town, colored women may be found c courageously battling with those evils with such conditions always entail. Many a heroine of whom the world will nev never hear has thus sacrificed her life to her race amid surroundings and in the face of privations which only martyrs can bear. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Ida B. Wells Barnett. Um, and we need to talk about the word lynching before we talk about her because it was um, a key point in her activism. So lynching is the group act of killing someone, especially by hanging, for an alleged offense without any trial. So her activism started because of an ejection from a train because she was black. After she saw her three friends lynched, she focused um, a lot of her energy, well, almost all of her energy on white mob violence against the black community. She investigated cases and then published her findings in many pamphlets and local newspapers across the South. And one of her most well-known pamphlet is called A Red Record. She was a staff writer for the New York Age and then was a lecturer and an organizer in anti-lynching societies. And she was, at the, she was at Niagara Falls for the founding of the NAACP which is still the largest black rights group in the U.S. today. And she participated in the meetings, but she was not mentioned as one of the official founders. In 1913, she founded the first black women's suffrage group called the Chicago Alpha Suffrage Club. And she went to the places where lynching happened, which is really crazy because Lynching was an epidemic in the South at this point, and she had no protection, and she was a black woman reporting on these crimes. And it, yeah, it just blows my mind that she had the courage to do this. And she published um, a red record, which was a pamphlet, like I mentioned before, and in it were details, detailed accounts of lynchings, which was the first statistical record um, of American lynchings in the history um, of the United States. And she even traveled internationally talking about lynching with foreign audiences, trying to bring attention to the issue. And throughout her activism, she destroyed and dismantled the mainstream media's idea that lynching victims were criminals who got what they deserved. Um, and this was a very harmful and prevalent narrative at the time. And she gave context, context through her reports of the violence committed against the black community in the South, and she openly confronted white women in the women's suffrage movement who ignored lynchings, and Wells tried to push the white suffragists on racial equality as racism was ingrained in the women's suffrage movement. I'm gonna be telling a story about Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, so Mary McLeod Bethune was born in Maysville, South Carolina in 1875. Um, she was the first in her family to receive a formal education. She studied to be a missionary, but instead decided to become a teacher. And after a few years teaching in South Carolina and Georgia, uh, she moved to Florida where she started two schools, one of which was the Industrial Institute for Negro Girls in Daytona Beach. In uh, 1922, the Ku Klux Klan planned to burn buildings at Bethune's boarding school in Florida. Um, she heard of their plan and she decided to take action. She had all the faculty put the girls at the boarding school to sleep and to take post at the entrances to the school. Bethune stayed at the main entrance and stood strong as over 100 robed Klansmen marched to the campus. After marching around the quad for just a few minutes, the members of the Klan turned back 
and left without any violence on either side. Some say that they turned back because they thought that there was an armed group of black men waiting if they burned anything. Other sources say that the Klan would, thought they would be able to deter people from voting just by showing up. So that, that's why they were there, is to deter people from voting. But then the following week, Bethune showed up to the polls with over 100 black citizens and proved that they weren't afraid of the Klan. Prophecy by Polly Murray. I sing of a new American, separate from all others, yet enlarged and diminished by all others. I am the child of kings and serfs, freemen and slaves, having neither superiors nor inferiors, progeny of all colors, all cultures, all systems, all beliefs. I have been enslaved, yet my spirit is unbound. I have been cast aside, but I sparkle in the darkness. I have been slain, but live on in the river of history. I seek no conquest, no wealth, no power, no revenge. I seek only discovery of the illimitable heights and depths of my own being. Dark Testament by Polly Murray. Then let the dream linger on. Let it be the test of nations, let it be the quest of all our days. The fevered pounding of our blood, the measure of our souls, that none shall rest in any land and none return to dreamless sleep. No heart be quieted, no tongue be stilled, until the final man may stand in any place and thrust his shoulders to the sky, friend and brother to every other man. I will be sharing a little bit about some wonderful black women that are involved in Virginia politics as well as United States politics. So first up is Jennifer Carroll Foy. Jennifer Carroll Foy was one of the first African American women to graduate from VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, uh, which you may have heard of recently for being under a lot of scrutiny for some racist practices. So we can appreciate truly how brave she was. She's a former public defender and she was a delegate from her hometown of Petersburg from 2017 to 2021. When she ran the first time, she was actually pregnant with twins. And so uh, that was uh, quite the challenge for her and she was able uh, to win. And she ran for governor in 2021 and placed second uh, behind Terry McAuliffe in the, Democratic in the Democratic primary. She led the fight for the ratification of the ERA, making Virginia the 38th and final state necessary to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Jennifer McClellan has been a state senator from the greater Richmond area to hold that office. Uh, she's an advocate for cannabis legislation, HBCUs, and many more progressive issues. She has recently gained a lot of popularity uh, on Twitter for becoming uh, the leader of the brick wall against many seemingly extreme policies from the Yunkin administration. Winsome Sears is uh, the 42nd Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. She is Glenn Youngkin's Lieutenant Governor. She's the first woman to hold that position and first woman of color to hold any kind of statewide office here in Virginia. She was born in Jamaica and she's a former United States Marine. Before becoming Lieutenant Governor, she was the delegate from Winchester for two, from 2002 to 2004 and she is a major uh, Second Amendment advocate as well as an advocate for personal choice. Kamala Harris is our vice president. She's the first woman and first woman of color to be the vice president of the United States and also to hold any kind of nationwide office. She was the district attorney from San Francisco from 2004 to 2011. She was the attorney general of California from 2011 to 2016. And she's the US senator from California from 2017 to 2021. Another notable thing about her is that she graduated from Howard, making her the first woman to uh, have any kind of HBCU in her education history uh, and that kind of uh, relevant government role. Nicole Hannah-Jones uh, is an award-winning journalist for the New York Times Magazine. She covers racial injustice and the civil rights movement. Uh, you probably have heard of her because of her groundbreaking project, the 1619 Project, uh, which details racial injustice and the history of enslaved persons in our nation. Uh, you also probably heard of her because of the controversy over her uh, gaining tenure at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And she ended up going and teaching at Howard, which is an historically black university. 
Stacey Abrams is a, uh, is a former member of the Georgia House of Representatives from 2007 to 2017, and she was the minority leader from 2011 to 2017, meaning she led the Democratic Party in that chamber. She was the nominee in the 2018 Georgia gubernatorial race. Uh, she was the first African-American woman to be nominated for a gubernatorial race by a major party. So it's pretty crazy that we do wait until 2018 to have that happen. Uh, she is also a major voting rights activist after she lost her 2018 gubernatorial race to Brian Kemp uh, due to uh, what many people believe uh, is voter fraud. Uh, she founded Fair Fight Action, which is a PAC that supports uh, candidates and other PACs and local projects nationwide that are working to uh, fix our voting system. And she is a prominent figure in the Democratic Party, uh, making many very famous speeches. And finally, Linda Thomas Greenfield uh, was the former U.S. ambassador to Liberia from 2008 to 2012. Uh, she's the United States uh, Assistant Secretary of State for, for, for African Affairs uh, from 2013 to 2017. And she is currently the United States ambassador to the United Nations, our worldwide uh, seemingly peacemaking body uh, since 2021, uh, so under the Biden administration. Now for some possible Supreme Court nominees. So we have Katanji Brown Jackson, who from 1996 to 1998 acted as a law clerk for both Patty B. Saris and Bruce M. Sela. And from 1999 to 2000, she clerked for Stephen Breyer. And 2005 to 2007, she served as an assistant public defender. And 2009 to 2014, she acted as a vice chair for the U.S. Sen Sentencing Committee. 2014 to now, she serves in the U.S. District Court in the, Colum to, in the Columbia District. Um, Leandra Kruger, 2001 to 2002, she worked as a law associate at the Jenner, Jenner and Block a law firm. 2002 to 2004, she was a law clerk for David Tattel and then John Paul Stevens. 2004 to 2006, she was an associate at Wilmer Coulter Pickering Hale and Door. And 2007 to 2013, she assistant to the United States Solicitor General, and she argued 12 cases before the Supreme Court, and she also worked on about a dozen more, but she didn't, like, argue them before the court. Um, 2014 to now, she was elected to the California Supreme Court. Michelle Childs. 1991 to 2001, she worked for the Nexon Pruitt Law Firm. 2000 to 2000. Two, she was deputy director of the South Carolina Department of Labor. 2002 to 2006, she served as a commissioner on the South Carolina's Workers' Compensation Commission. In 2006, she was elected as the, Rich the Richland County Circuit Court Judge. And then from 2000 to now, she serves as the judge on the District Court of South Carolina. Um, I'll be reading an excerpt from the poem, We Rise, by Amanda Gorman. Today, everyone's eyes are on us as we rise. Today is the day women are paving the way, speaking our truth to power. In this hour, it is our duty to find the brave beauty in reading for other women, so they too know we are not victims. We are victors, the greatest predictors of progress. We press for change, a new dawn drawn into the open by women whose silence is broken. We push on and act on our responsibility to bring visibility to the most vulnerable, to bring freedom to those who didn't have a choice, to bring volume to those who are using their voice. We clear a woman's way. We don't fear the day she steps into the light because we are with her every step of the fight. Thank you very much. Thanks for letting us go over a little bit. We did shrink down the number of women we have. So there are many more incredible women we wish we could tell you about. Uh, but we appreciate the impacts of these women on history and hope they encourage you to learn about more Americans who are making changes in society today. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>